Violent rhetoric at political rallies and in public discourse can have significant and dangerous consequences, potentially leading to acts of violence and social unrest. The correlation between such rhetoric and subsequent violent actions is complex but can be understood through several key factors. Normalization of violence. When political leaders or influential figures use aggressive language, it can normalize violence as an acceptable means of expressing dissatisfaction or disagreement. This can embolden individuals who might otherwise refrain from violent behavior. Echo chamber effect. In today's media landscape, people often consume information from sources that align with their pre-existing beliefs. This echo chamber effect can amplify extreme views and lead to dehumanization of opposing groups, making violence against them seem more justified. Emotional provocation. Violent rhetoric can provoke strong emotional responses, such as anger and fear, which can lower inhibitions and increase the likelihood of impulsive, aggressive actions. Inspirational violence. Certain individuals may be inspired to act out violently based on the perceived endorsement or encouragement of their actions by prominent figures. They might interpret the rhetoric as a call to action. Escalation of conflict. Once violence occurs, it can escalate quickly. Counter-protests or retaliatory actions can lead to further violence, creating a cycle that is difficult to break. Mental health and individual vulnerabilities. Some individuals who are already prone to violent behavior due to personal issues or mental health conditions might be triggered by violent rhetoric to act in ways they might not have otherwise. Legal and ethical boundaries. Violent rhetoric can blur the lines between free speech and incitement to violence. While freedom of speech is protected, inciting imminent lawless action is not. Politicians and public figures must be mindful of these boundaries. To mitigate these dangers, it's crucial for leaders and public figures to use measured and responsible language. They should actively promote peaceful dialogue and respect for differing viewpoints. Additionally, media literacy and critical thinking skills are essential for the public to recognize and resist the influence of harmful rhetoric. Communities also play a role in promoting nonviolent conflict resolution and in holding individuals accountable for their actions. The connection between rhetoric and actions, especially in high-profile cases like that of former President Donald Trump, is complex and multifaceted. Here are some specific actions that could have potentially mitigated the risks associated with violent rhetoric. Responsible speech. Trump could have chosen to use language that does not suggest or condone violence. Leaders have a responsibility to set a tone that promotes unity and respect for the rule of law. Clarifying statements. Whenever ambiguous or inflammatory remarks were made, clear and immediate clarifications could have been issued to prevent misinterpretation as calls to violence. Engagement with social media platforms. Instead of pushing the boundaries of acceptable discourse on platforms like Twitter, engaging in more constructive dialogue could have avoided bans and reduced tensions. Legal and ethical advisement. Having legal and ethical advisors closely monitor public statements to ensure they do not cross into incitement territory could have helped maintain a safer discourse. Promotion of peaceful protests and dialogue, encouraging peaceful methods of expression and actively promoting dialogue between differing political views can reduce the likelihood of violence. Self-reflection and adjustment, recognizing the impact of one's words on others and adjusting communication strategies accordingly can significantly alter the narrative and reduce tensions. Public apologies and retractions, when rhetoric escalates or causes harm, public apologies and retractions can help to de-escalate situations and show a commitment to responsible leadership. Regarding the claim about assassinating political enemies, such a statement would be highly inappropriate and illegal. It's important to note that the Supreme Court granting immunity for official acts does not extend to criminal acts such as ordering or carrying out assassinations. Such interpretations of legal rulings are not supported by law and can contribute to dangerous misunderstandings. While it's impossible to know definitively if these actions would have prevented any specific event, they could have contributed to a less charged and more respectful political climate. It's always crucial for leaders to consider the potential consequences of their words and actions on their followers and the broader society. So let's see what leads to these things, shall we? August 11, 2015, Trump indirectly took aim at Black Lives Matter protesters, calling Senator Bernie Sanders weak after Sanders allowed protesters to seize the microphone at a campaign rally. I thought that was disgusting. That showed such weakness, the way he was taken away by two young women. They just took the whole place over. Trump added, that will never happen with me. 
I don't know if I'll do the fighting myself or if other people will. But that was a disgrace. I felt badly for him, but it showed that he's weak. August 19, 2015, two Boston brothers invoked Trump when they were arrested for urinating on a homeless man and beating him with a metal pipe. While in custody, one of the brothers told the police, Trump was right. All of these illegals need to be deported. The 58-year-old Mexican-American they assaulted was a permanent U.S. resident. In response to the news that the Boston assault was inspired by his rhetoric, Trump did not denounce the violence, instead calling his supporters passionate. I think that would be a shame. I will say, the people that are following me are very passionate. They love this country. They want this country to be great again. But they are very passionate. I will say that, he told reporters the next day. October 23, 2015, after repeatedly being interrupted by protesters at a campaign rally in Miami, Trump warned he'll be a little more violent next time when addressing protesters. See, the first group, I was nice. Oh, take your time. The second group, I was pretty nice. The third group, I'll be a little more violent. And the fourth group, I'll say get the hell out of here, he said. On video, the pro-immigration protesters could be seen being forcibly dragged out of the campaign event. November 21, 2015, at a rally in Birmingham, Alabama, Trump demanded the removal of black activist Mercutio Southall Jr. after he yelled, Black Lives Matter. On stage, Trump exclaimed, Get him the hell out of here. Get him out of here. Throw him out. In a video captured by CNN, Southall fell to the ground as Trump made his statements and white men appeared to kick and punch him. December 2015, the Trump campaign devised a strategy to address protesters who demonstrated at rallies. Instead of harming the protester, the campaign suggested they chant, Trump. Trump. Trump, until a security guard removed the protester. The campaign began playing an announcement of the plan at rallies in mid-December, which started with the line, if a protester starts demonstrating in the area around you, please do not touch or harm the protester. This is a peaceful rally. According to the Washington Post, attendees laughed when the announcement was played at a rally. 2016, at campaign rallies, Trump models the violence that he encourages by making a spectacle out of ejecting protesters. At his large campaign rallies, Trump would often yell get him out, at protesters who demonstrated, whether they stood there silently, held up a sign, or chanted. Though Trump often alleged that the protesters were violent, reporters in 2016 found no evidence to suggest that protesters had attacked Trump supporters at one of his rallies. In 2016, Trump sharpened his rhetoric against Muslims, suggesting that the country must scrutinize mosques and newly arrived Muslim migrants. 2016 also gave rise to the chant that advocated for violence against then-Democratic presidential frontrunner Hillary Clinton, lock her up. January 8, 2016, Rose Hamad, a 56-year-old Muslim woman wearing a hijab, was escorted out of a Trump rally after standing up in silent protest over Trump's speech, in which he said Syrian refugees fleeing war were affiliated with ISIS. Hamad attended the rally to show Trump supporters what Muslims are like, Trump had already called for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States in December 2015, and told CNN's Don Lemon that the people sitting around her were very nice and sharing their popcorn. But once the crowd got this hateful crowd mentality, as she was being escorted out, it was a vivid example of what happens when you start using this hateful rhetoric and how it can incite a crowd where moments ago were very kind to me. Hamid said one man yelled to her, get out. Do you have a bomb? Do you have a bomb? January 23, 2016, at a campaign rally in Iowa, Trump, in describing the loyalty of his supporters, notoriously said, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose voters. February 1, 2016, at a campaign rally in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Trump told the crowd that his security team informed him there may be somebody throwing tomatoes. If you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. Just knock the hell out of them. I promise you, I will pay for the legal fees. I promise. There won't be so much of them because the courts agree with us, he said. February 23, 2016, at a campaign rally in Las Vegas, Trump said of a protester, I'd like to punch him in the face. 
As security guards escorted the protester out of the rally, Trump mocked him, saying, he's smiling. Having a good time. He then reminisced about being able to get away with violence. There's a guy, totally disruptive, throwing punches. We're not allowed to punch back anymore. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. Trump also called the protester nasty as hell. CNN reported that the man did not appear to fight with the security guards taking him outside. At the same rally, Trump would reiterate his support for waterboarding, a banned interrogation method. They said to me, what do you think of waterboarding? I said I think it's great, but we don't go far enough. It's true. We don't go far enough. We don't go far enough. At a February 6th Republican debate in New Hampshire, Trump said he would bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding if he were elected president. February 27, 2016, Trump advocated for police state violence, lamenting how officers are afraid to do their jobs because America is becoming a frightened country. You see, in the good old days, law enforcement acted a lot quicker than this. A lot quicker. In the good old days, they'd rip him out of that seat so fast, but today, everybody's politically correct, Trump said. Our country's going to hell with being politically correct. Going to hell. March 1, 2016, at a campaign rally in Louisville, Kentucky, Trump repeatedly yelled, Get out of here. Get him out of here. Get him the hell out, to a group of protesters, galvanizing the crowd to chant, USA. USA, and physically shoved the group of black protesters. Trump continued, don't hurt him. If I say, go get him, I get in trouble with the press, the most dishonest human beings in the world. If I say, don't hurt him, the press will say, well, Trump isn't as tough as he used to be. So you can't win. March 9, 2016, a 78-year-old white male Trump supporter punched a black male protester being escorted out of a Trump campaign rally in Fayetteville, North Carolina. The Trump supporter was recorded on video saying he enjoyed knocking the hell out of that big mouth and yes, he deserved it. The next time we see him, we might have to kill him. He was arrested and charged with assault a day later, though he attacked the protester directly in front of law enforcement officials. Instead, at the time, law enforcement officials tackled the protester to the ground after he had been punched in the face. Two days after the assault, Trump said such attacks on protesters were very, very appropriate and the kind of action we need a little bit more of. Trump called the protesters very violent, though multiple news outlets at the time reported that there were no documented cases of protesters inciting violence against Trump supporters. March 10, 2016, at a Miami Republican debate, Trump denied that his tone incited violence at his rallies and insinuated that the anger toward protesters was justified. I will say this, he told CNN's Jake Tapper. We have 25, 30,000 people. You've seen it yourself. People come with tremendous passion and love for the country, and when they see protest, in some cases, you know, you're mentioning one case, which I haven't seen, I heard about it, which I don't like. But when they see what's going on in this country, they have anger that's unbelievable. They have anger. He added, we have some protesters who are bad dudes, they have done bad things. They are swinging, they are really dangerous. And if they've got to be taken out, to be honest, I mean, we have to run something. March 11, 2016, Trump abandoned a planned Chicago campaign rally after fights broke out between his supporters and protesters. Five people were arrested and two police officers were injured, according to the Chicago police. In a tweet, Trump blamed thugs for the chaos. March 31, 2016, three people who say they were assaulted at a March 1, 2016, Trump campaign rally in Louisville, Kentucky, sued the then-candidate, alleging that he riled up his followers and encouraged violence when he repeatedly yelled, Get him out of here! The group sued Trump for incitement to riot, and in April 2017, federal judge David Hale ruled that their claim was valid since there was sufficient evidence proving their injuries were a direct and proximate result of Trump's comments. It is plausible that Trump's direction to get M out of here advocated the use of force, Hale wrote. It was an order, an instruction, a command. Trump appealed the case, and in September 2018, a federal appeals court dismissed the protesters' claims, saying that Trump's words were protected under the First Amendment and did not specifically advocate imminent lawless violence. 
An attorney for the plaintiffs called the ruling unprecedented and dangerous, and a free pass for a candidate for public office. July 2016, by July, the infamous lock her up, chant in response to any mention of Hillary Clinton became a facet of Trump's rallies and even the GOP convention. On July 19, at the Republican National Convention, the crowd chanted, lock her up. Lock her up. Lock her up, as Chris Christie delivered a speech. At a rally in Colorado Springs on July 29th, Trump, after resisting joining in on the chant at rallies, told the audience, I've been saying let's just beat her on November 8th. But you know what, I'm starting to agree with you. Trump's comments came after Clinton criticized him in her Democratic National Convention address. You know it's interesting. Every time I mention her, everyone screams, lock her up, lock her up. They keep screaming. And you know what I do? I've been nice, Trump said. But after watching that performance last night, such lies, I don't have to be so nice anymore. I'm taking the gloves off. But crowds and commentators didn't stop at lock her up. As The Atlantic reported, some called for Clinton to be hung on the mall in Washington, D.C., or put in a firing line and shot for treason. December 2016, after Trump bullied then-Fox News journalist Megyn Kelly for months, Kelly said that Trump's social media director was responsible for inciting the many death threats she was receiving. The vast majority of Donald Trump supporters are not at all this way, Kelly said, according to The Guardian. It's that far corner of the internet that really enjoys nastiness and threats and unfortunately there is a man who works for Donald Trump whose job it is to stir these people up and that man needs to stop doing that. His name is Dan Scavino. 2017, with Trump in office, white supremacists organize and are emboldened to march in public, Trump also amplifies his attacks on the press. In 2017, Trump sharply criticized the press, calling it the enemy of the American people, fueling hostility toward journalists that many say led to violence. He also failed to condemn white supremacist and white nationalist groups that organized in Charlottesville, Virginia. The Unite the Reich rally became a turning point for the nation, prompting many people to finally stop and question the impact of Trump's rhetoric. January 27, 2017, on the day the Trump administration instituted a ban against travelers from seven predominantly Muslim countries, a Muslim Delta employee wearing a hijab was physically and verbally attacked at JFK International Airport in New York. The perpetrator told the victim, expletive, Islam. Expletive, ISIS. Trump is here now. He will get rid of all of you, according to ABC. On the campaign trail, Trump said he was open to the idea of closing mosques and creating a database of all Muslims in the U.S., consistently saying that Muslims were a problem and a sickness. February 17, 2017, in what the New York Times called a striking escalation in his attacks, Trump tweeted that the news media is the enemy of the American people. Trump had long blamed news organizations for misrepresenting his agenda and performance, but in February he more explicitly positioned the media as a key opponent. At a press conference on February 16, Trump strategically called the media dishonest and labeled reporting from outlets like CNN fake news. Onlookers argued that Trump's rhetoric toward the press led to violent attacks on reporters. As Jeff Coy reported in 2017, anti-media rhetoric has abounded since the election, pointing to examples of physical hostility toward journalists at the time. In West Virginia last month, Dan Heyman of Public News Service was handcuffed and arrested at the state capitol building for posing questions to Tom Price, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And in Washington last week, a reporter from CQ Roll Call was pushed against a wall by security guards for asking an FCC commissioner questions in the lobby of a public building. July 28, 2017, during a speech to law enforcement officials in Long Island, New York, Trump encouraged police to be more violent when handling suspects and potential offenders. Now, we're getting them, criminals, out anyway, but we'd like to get them out a lot faster, and when you see these towns and when you see these thugs being thrown into the back of a paddy wagon, you just see them thrown in, rough, I said, please don't be too nice. Like when you guys put somebody in the car and you're protecting their head, you know, the way you put their hand over, like, don't hit their head and they've just killed somebody. Don't hit their head. I said, you can take the hand away, okay? In the 35-minute speech, Trump discussed his plan to fight MS-13 gang violence, calling the gang's members animals who had transformed peaceful parks and beautiful quiet neighborhoods into blood-stained killing fields. 
August 12, 2017, one of the clearest moments in which Trump refused to denounce violence, and thereby encouraged it, was when he equated the white supremacists who marched in Charlottesville, Virginia, as part of a Unite the Reich rally with the leftist protesters who demonstrated against them. During the rally, a Nazi sympathizer drove a car into a crowd of anti-racism counter-protesters, killing 32-year-old Heather Heyer. The evening before, on August 11, the neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups marched at the University of Virginia, carrying lit tiki torches and chanting anti-Semitic slogans, in response to the impending removal of a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. As Tara Golshin reported for Vox, Trump's very first response to the events in Charlottesville was to condemn violence on the part of many players, while initially refusing to even mention the presence of white supremacist groups. In a short statement issued that day, Trump said from his golf club in New Jersey, we condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry and violence on many sides, on many sides. It has been going on for a long time in our country, not Donald Trump, not Barack Obama. It has been going on for a long, long time. It has no place in America. That same night, he tweeted condolences to Hire's family but made no mention of who was responsible for the violence. Trump called for there to be a study to understand what happened in Charlottesville. On the Tuesday following the weekend rally, Trump infamously said, you had some very bad people in that group. You also had some very fine people on both sides. The president also attempted to identify the good people in the sea of white nationalists that weekend, you had people and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists. They should be condemned totally. You had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists. Not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. Trump turned the NFL players' silent protest about police violence into a debate about nationalism. This became emblematic of a larger push, Trump continues to spin issues of racial injustice as an affront to American life, riling up his base, many supporters set fire to NFL team merchandise. 2018, Trump still fails to condemn white supremacists as hate crimes are on the rise. Multiple studies released between 2017 and 2019 showed how hate crimes reached a high during the first two years of Trump's presidency. A report from the FBI found that hate crimes, especially against Muslims, increased by 5% in 2016 and were up 17% in 2017. In 2018, hate crimes reached a 16-year high, with a significant rise in violence against Latinos. According to a 2019 report, counties that hosted a rally with Trump as a headliner experienced a 226% increase in hate crimes. The report's authors noted, Trump's rhetoric may encourage hate crimes. At the middle point of his term, when confronted with opportunities to condemn white supremacy and attempt to unify the country, Trump declined to do so. June 24, 2018, amid his administration's family separation crisis, Trump fanned the flames of anti-immigration sentiment. He tweeted rhetoric that justified his administration's zero-tolerance immigration policy, which featured ICE raids and migrant detention facilities. Between October 1, 2017, and May 31, 2018, at least 2,700 children were split from their families at the border. We cannot allow all of these people to invade our country. When somebody comes in, we must immediately, with no judges or court cases, bring them back from where they came. Our system is a mockery to good immigration policy and law and order. Most children come without parents, he wrote. August 11, 2018, a year after the inaugural Unite the Right rally, organizers planned a second Unite the Right event, yet Trump still failed to condemn the hate groups by name. Ahead of the rally, he tweeted a rather vague statement against hate and did not acknowledge and condemn the people perpetrating the violence. October 18, 2018, at a rally in Montana, Trump celebrated Republican Rep. Greg John Forte, who body slammed a reporter in May 2017, telling the crowd, any guy who can do a body slam, he's my guy. John Forte assaulted journalist Ben Jacobs after Jacobs asked him a question about the GOP healthcare bill, on the day before John Forte won election. He ultimately apologized, after his spokesperson first denied the assault, and pleaded guilty to misdemeanor assault. John Forte was sentenced with 40 hours of community service, 20 hours of anger management, and a $300 fine along with an $85 court fee, in addition to a deferred 180-day jail sentence. 
As Jeff Coy reported for Vox in 2017, the assault revealed how the Republican Party, at Trump's behest, has grown comfortable with verbal and physical violence against the press. October 22 to November 1, 2018, Caesar Sayoc, a Florida Trump supporter, mailed 16 inoperative pipe bombs to Democratic leaders, including Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and Hillary Clinton, who had been critical of Trump's presidency. Sayoc had been living in a van that was covered in photos of Trump and decals attacking the media, according to NBC News. Sayoc's lawyers argued that Trump's rhetoric fueled his actions and that Sayoc viewed Trump as a surrogate father. On August 4, 2019, Sayoc was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Trump first condemned Sayoc's actions, but then walked back his condemnation. In these times we have to unify, Trump said. We have to come together and send one very clear, strong, unmistakable message that acts or threats of political violence of any kind have no place in the United States of America. October 27, 2018, an anti-Semitic terrorist murdered 11 worshippers and injured seven others at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Though the shooter criticized Trump for being a globalist who was controlled by Jews, many critics linked Trump's rhetoric to the mass shooting. Jewish leaders in Pittsburgh wrote an open letter to Trump demanding that he fully denounce white nationalism before visiting a city in mourning. For the past three years your words and your policies have emboldened a growing white nationalist movement, the letter said. You yourself called the murderer evil, but yesterday's violence is the direct culmination of your influence. Trump first lamented the shooting but then suggested that the victims should have protected themselves by having an armed guard inside the synagogue and distanced himself from the National Rifle Association when asked about his ties to the organization. 2019, mass shootings and hate crimes linked to Trump's rhetoric continued, while he lashed out at a group of newly elected congresswomen. Instead of denouncing the white supremacy and hate fueling many mass shootings, Trump pointed to mental illness as a key factor behind domestic terrorism. As Trump returned the campaign trail in an attempt to gain a second term, he targeted a new group at his campaign events, a group of young congresswomen of color, known as the Squad. May 8, 2019, at a Florida rally, Trump turned the idea of shooting migrants and asylum seekers into a punchline. In his remarks, he asked, how do you stop these people? A woman at the rally reportedly yelled shoot them in response. Trump then joked, that's only in the panhandle, you can get away with that statement. Trump's statement came a day after reports that a border militia member said of migrants, why are we just apprehending them and not lining them up and shooting them? We have to go back to Hitler days and put them all in a gas chamber. July 14, 2019, Trump attacked the group of congresswomen known as the Squad, saying on Twitter that they should go back to the crime-infested places from which they came. Trump didn't initially name the lawmakers he was attack. Three days later at a Trump 2020 campaign rally in Greenville, North Carolina, the crowd repeatedly chanted send her back. Send her back, directed at Representative Omar, whom Trump began to single out from the squad, which he described that night as a group of hate-filled extremists. Rump's rhetoric toward Omar and the rest of the squad led to death threats and increased security for the women. In April, just hours after a man was charged for threatening to assault and murder Omar, Trump again told harmful lies about her at an event. The man told officials that he loves the president and hates radical Muslims in our government. In June, Plaid read out a death threat she received that said, the only good Muslim is a dead one. August 3, 2019, in one of the larger calamities of Trump's presidency, a 21-year-old white man opened fire at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, killing 23 people and injuring 22 others. As Alexia Fernandez Campbell reported for Vox, the shooter drove more than 10 hours to the store to target Mexicans. Officials believe that the gunman was the author of a racist, xenophobic online manifesto that warned of a Hispanic invasion of Texas and echoed the president's language, according to the New York Times. Trump responded to the shooting in a brief speech but said nothing about widespread criticism of his own anti-immigrant rhetoric, which some say inspired the El Paso attacks, Fernandez Campbell reported. August 5, 2019, a 39-year-old Montana man was charged with felony assault for choking, slamming, and fracturing the skull of a 13-year-old boy who didn't take his hat off for the national anthem. The man's attorney told the local newspaper that Trump's rhetoric led to the violent act. 
His commander-in-chief is telling people that if they kneel, they should be fired, or if they burn a flag, they should be punished, the lawyer said, referencing Trump's harsh words against athletes like Colin Kaepernick who protested for social justice. October 1, 2019, a New York Times report stated that Trump, as part of his border security plan in early 2019, reportedly wanted to shoot migrants in the legs and keep them away from the southern border with a trench filled with water, alligators, and snakes. Trump also reportedly asked for a cost estimate for an electrified wall with spikes that could pierce human flesh. November 1, 2019, a 61-year-old Milwaukee man was arrested and charged with a felony hate crime after allegedly throwing acid at a Peruvian-American who was walking to a Mexican restaurant. The perpetrator accused the victim of being in the country illegally, asking him, why you invade my country, and why don't you respect my laws, before attacking him. When police searched the perpetrator's home, they found three letters addressed to Donald Trump. The victim suffered second-degree burns. 2020, Trump is explicit about the kinds of violence he is willing to use against Black Lives Matter protesters. As Black Lives Matter protests swept the country this summer following the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, a key thread running through Trump's response was to call for and send in law enforcement officials, the National Guard, Secret Service Police, local police, U.S. Park Police, and state troopers, who dressed in riot gear and used a variety of weapons, from tear gas to rubber bullets. While he said violence was out of hand in cities, the protests were mostly peaceful, outside of escalation by police. In fact, after Homeland Security agents were deployed in Portland in the summer, violent demonstrations increased from under 17 percent to over 42 percent, according to a report. Amid the unrest, Trump also repeatedly failed to identify and call out white supremacist agitators and counter-protesters who traveled to cities and towns and incited violence. And throughout the country, Asian Americans faced violence due to fears about the coronavirus. Trump has repeatedly used a racist name for the virus, calling it the Chinese flu or the Chinese virus. It's one of many ways he has downplayed COVID-19 and cast blame elsewhere for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans, many of whom are people of color. March 14, 2020, 19-year-old Jose L. Gomez stabbed three members of an Asian-American family, including a two-year-old and a six-year-old, at a Sam's Club in Texas. According to the FBI's report obtained by ABC News, Gomez said he attacked them because he thought the family was Chinese and infecting people with the coronavirus. Gomez was charged with three counts of attempted capital murder and one count of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. In a report released in late March, the FBI warned that hate crimes against Asian Americans would surge, and were already surging, due to rhetoric that associated the disease with China and Asian American populations. Trump began calling the coronavirus the Chinese virus early in the pandemic and defended his use of the phrase against frequent criticism, saying, it did come from China. It is a very accurate term. Catherine Kim reported for Vox that the phrase fits into Trump's pattern of xenophobia and pattern of deflecting blame. After a week of anti-Asian rhetoric, Trump tweeted, It is very important that we totally protect our Asian American community, but other Asian Americans, they end us, in his next tweet. On October 8, a few days after being released from Walter Reed Medical Center, where he was treated for the virus, Trump released a video in which he again blamed China. China's going to pay a big price for what they've done to this country, Trump said. May 29, 2020, following the first weekend of social justice protests after George Floyd's killing, Trump threatened to shoot looters in Minneapolis. His tweet thread showed the tone that would dominate his reaction to the unrest in the following months, he called protesters thugs and said, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter flagged Trump's tweet for glorifying violence. As Caitlin Burns reported for Vox, a day later, Trump tried to walk back the phrase on Twitter by claiming he meant that when looting starts, people end up getting shot. June 1, 2020, police officers in Washington, D.C., attacked hundreds of peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square with tear gas to make way for Trump, who traveled from the White House to St. John's Church for a photo op. Before visiting the church, Trump said in a speech, if a city or state refuses to take the actions necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. The remarks fit into Trump's repeated call for law and order. August 29, 2020, at an emergency operations briefing in Texas, Trump expressed interest in sending the National Guard to Portland to meet protesters with force. We sent in 1,000 National Guard, and that's not even a big force. 
We could clean out, as an example, Portland. We could fix Portland in, I would say, 45 minutes. August 31, 2020, after Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old black man, was shot seven times by police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, protests broke out across the country. The next day, a group of armed men including 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse from Illinois showed up in Kenosha, saying they were there to protect property. Rittenhouse, a law enforcement enthusiast and a Trump supporter, shot and killed two people and injured another, he was later charged with murder. Trump later appeared to justify Rittenhouse's actions by saying he was acting in self-defense. At a press briefing, Trump told reporters, I guess it looks like he fell and then they very violently attacked him and it was something we're looking at right now and it's under investigation. I guess he was in very big trouble. He probably would have been killed. But it's under investigation. September 1, 2020, before traveling to Kenosha, Trump said he was going to the city to show support for law enforcement. He did not visit Blake's family or mention Blake by name instead, he said the officer who shot him must have choked. Trump also said that law enforcement was ready to stop protests very powerfully. As soon as they came in, boom, the flame was gone. Now maybe it will start up again, in which case they will put it out very powerfully, he said. Blake's family and Wisconsin leaders feared that Trump's visit would lead to more violence and destruction. September 17, 2020, in August 2020, an Antifa supporter was accused of shooting and killing a pro-Trump activist during Portland, Oregon protests. The suspect, Michael Reinal, was killed by law enforcement officers in early September. In an interview with Janine Pirro on the 17th, Trump praised law enforcement for killing Reinal. Vox's Aaron Rupar wrote, It's bad enough that the president is more or less endorsing extrajudicial killings before all the relevant facts are known, and despite an eyewitness saying it was unjustified. But it's even worse viewed in light of how Trump is politicizing street violence. September 29, 2020, at the first presidential debate for the general election, when given the opportunity to denounce white supremacy, Trump spoke directly to a hate group, the Proud Boys, instructing them to stand back and stand by. In response, the Proud Boys instantly expressed gratitude and joy at being recognized by the president. Days later, after receiving bipartisan criticism, Trump told Fox News that he condemns far-right hate groups. Let me be clear again, I condemn the KKK. I condemn all white supremacists, he said. I condemn the Proud Boys. I don't know much about the Proud Boys, almost nothing, but I condemn that. However, as E.J. Dixon argued in Rolling Stone, there are reasons to believe that Trump knows who the Proud Boys are, from his connection to Roger Stone, who has close ties to the Proud Boys, to the fact that Proud Boys regularly attend Trump rallies, with a Proud Boy co-chair sitting directly behind Trump at a Miami rally in 2019. October 8, 2020, six men face conspiracy charges in a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. As Vox's Andrew Prokop reported, the conspirators were in contact with a militia group based in Michigan, training in tactics and weapons with the group, and attempting to build an explosive device with a militia group member. The men were reportedly angry about Whitmer's coronavirus shutdown policies. In August, Trump had tweeted Liberate Michigan after the state instituted a stay-at-home order to combat the pandemic. In response to the FBI's investigation of the kidnapping plot, Trump demanded that Whitmer thank him. And he chastised Whitmer for the very thing that the conspirators targeted her for, taking action against the spread of a deadly virus that Trump has waved off as a threat. In a live stream address, Whitmer said that Trump gives comfort to those who spread fear and hatred and division. She pointed to Trump's comments at the presidential debate and called him complicit. May 29, 2020, following the first weekend of social justice protests after George Floyd's killing, Trump threatened to shoot looters in Minneapolis. His tweet thread showed the tone that would dominate his reaction to the unrest in the following months, he called protesters thugs and said, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter flagged Trump's tweet for glorifying violence. As Caitlin Burns reported for Vox, a day later, Trump tried to walk back the phrase on Twitter by claiming he meant that when looting starts, people end up getting shot. June 1, 2020, police officers in Washington, D.C., attacked hundreds of peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square with tear gas to make way for Trump, who traveled from the White House to St. John's Church for a photo op. Before visiting the church, Trump said in a speech, if a city or state refuses to take the actions necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. 
The remarks fit into Trump's repeated call for law and order. August 29, 2020, at an emergency operations briefing in Texas, Trump expressed interest in sending the National Guard to Portland to meet protesters with force. We sent in 1,000 National Guard, and that's not even a big force. We could clean out, as an example, Portland, we could fix Portland in, I would say, 45 minutes. August 31, 2020, after Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old black man, was shot seven times by police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, protests broke out across the country. The next day, a group of armed men including 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse from Illinois showed up in Kenosha, saying they were there to protect property. Rittenhouse, a law enforcement enthusiast and a Trump supporter, shot and killed two people and injured another, he was later charged with murder. Trump later appeared to justify Rittenhouse's actions by saying he was acting in self-defense. At a press briefing, Trump told reporters, I guess it looks like he fell and then they very violently attacked him and it was something we're looking at right now and it's under investigation. I guess he was in very big trouble. He probably would have been killed. But it's under investigation. September 1, 2020, before traveling to Kenosha, Trump said he was going to the city to show support for law enforcement. He did not visit Blake's family or mention Blake by name instead, he said the officer who shot him must have choked. Trump also said that law enforcement was ready to stop protests very powerfully. As soon as they came in, boom, the flame was gone. Now maybe it will start up again, in which case they will put it out very powerfully, he said. Blake's family and Wisconsin leaders feared that Trump's visit would lead to more violence and destruction. September 17, 2020, in August 2020, an Antifa supporter was accused of shooting and killing a pro-Trump activist during Portland, Oregon protests. The suspect, Michael Reinal, was killed by law enforcement officers in early September. In an interview with Janine Pirro on the 17th, Trump praised law enforcement for killing Reinal. Vox's Aaron Rupar wrote, It's bad enough that the president is more or less endorsing extrajudicial killings before all the relevant facts are known, and despite an eyewitness saying it was unjustified. But it's even worse viewed in light of how Trump is politicizing street violence. September 29, 2020, at the first presidential debate for the general election, when given the opportunity to denounce white supremacy, Trump spoke directly to a hate group, the Proud Boys, instructing them to stand back and stand by. In response, the Proud Boys instantly expressed gratitude and joy at being recognized by the president. Days later, after receiving bipartisan criticism, Trump told Fox News that he condemns far-right hate groups. Let me be clear again, I condemn the KKK. I condemn all white supremacists, he said. I condemn the Proud Boys. I don't know much about the Proud Boys, almost nothing, but I condemn that. However, as E.J. Dixon argued in Rolling Stone, there are reasons to believe that Trump knows who the Proud Boys are, from his connection to Roger Stone, who has close ties to the Proud Boys, to the fact that Proud Boys regularly attend Trump rallies, with a Proud Boy co-chair sitting directly behind Trump at a Miami rally in 2019. October 8, 2020, six men face conspiracy charges in a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. As Vox's Andrew Prokop reported, the conspirators were in contact with a militia group based in Michigan, training in tactics and weapons with the group, and attempting to build an explosive device with a militia group member. The men were reportedly angry about Whitmer's coronavirus shutdown policies. In August, Trump had tweeted Liberate Michigan after the state instituted a stay-at-home order to combat the pandemic. In response to the FBI's investigation of the kidnapping plot, Trump demanded that Whitmer thank him. And he chastised Whitmer for the very thing that the conspirators targeted her for taking action against the spread of a deadly virus that Trump has waved off as a threat. In a live stream address, Whitmer said that Trump gives comfort to those who spread fear and hatred and division. She pointed to Trump's comments at the presidential debate and called him complicit. In August, Trump had tweeted Liberate Michigan after the state instituted a stay-at-home order to combat the pandemic. In response to the FBI's investigation of the kidnapping plot, Trump demanded that Whitmer thank him. And he chastised Whitmer for the very thing that the conspirators targeted her for taking action against the spread of a deadly virus that Trump has waved off as a threat. In a live stream address, Whitmer said that Trump gives comfort to those who spread fear and hatred and division. She pointed to Trump's comments at the presidential debate and called him complicit. 
Just last week, the President of the United States stood before the American people and refused to condemn white supremacists and hate groups like these two Michigan militia groups. Hate groups heard the President's words not as a rebuke, but as a rallying cry, as a call to action. When our leaders speak, their words matter. They carry weight. When our leaders meet with, encourage, or fraternize with domestic terrorists, they legitimize their actions and they are complicit. When they stoke and contribute to hate speech, they are complicit. 2021, after losing the presidential election to Joe Biden, Trump continued a dangerous effort to overturn Biden's victory. January 6, 2021, on the day that Congress moved to certify the 2020 presidential election results confirming Biden as the winner, Trump encouraged thousands of his supporters to dispute vote counts. At an outdoor rally in Washington, D.C., Trump turned on Republicans who refused to support his efforts to overturn the election results, calling them weak, and urged Vice President Mike Pence to reject the Electoral College results. Trump told listeners, you will never take back our country with weakness. Trump's lawyer Rudy Giuliani also delivered a speech in which he encouraged trial by combat. He encouraged them to head to the Capitol to support objections to certification of the vote. Hours of violence followed the speech when supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol, as well as state capitals across the country. Capitol Police fatally shot Ashley Babbitt, a Trump supporter, as she and others tried to breach the halls of the Senate. Four others died, including a police officer. Washington, D.C., Mayor Muriel Bowser imposed a citywide curfew beginning at 6 p.m., and few people were arrested, though many rioters violated the restriction. That evening, Trump again equivocated in messages to supporters, making little attempt to try to stop the violence. He later denounced the violence, but refused to clearly state he lost the election. According to the New York Times, he soon expressed regret to White House aides about committing to a peaceful transfer of power and condemning the Capitol attack. That leads us to the date of the insurrection by the Christian Nationalist Cult Party that is today's Republicans in July of 2024. So let's talk about what happened yesterday. Shall we? On July 11th Trump already being an adjudicated rapist and convicted felon as well as having a woman using the pseudonym Katie Johnson twice file a civil lawsuit against Trump and billionaire Jeffrey Epstein accusing them of having sexually abused her when she was 13 years old. July 13, 2024, Trump is shot and wounded in assassination attempt as hail of bullets erupts at campaign rally on July 13 by a man named Thomas Matthew Crooks. A 20-year-old man from Pennsylvania has been identified as the suspect who attempted to assassinate Donald Trump at a political rally in the United States, law enforcement officials said. Thomas Matthew Crooks has been named as the subject involved in the incident, the FBI said in a statement. Crooks, who was killed by Secret Service snipers at the scene, was from Bethel Park, close to where the rally was held on Saturday local time. This is what we know so far about the suspect and how the shooting played out. One attendee was killed and two critically injured in the incident, according to authorities. Crooks had not been attending the rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. He is suspected of carrying out the attack from a rooftop on a building outside the event. So I ask you after all of this. How can you be surprised this has happened? How can you defend January 6th and violent protest, fight against gun regulations, tell women who have been victims of rape they have to keep their rape baby for 18 years and deal with their rape baby's daddy, the rapist, because some Supreme Court anti-justice Christian nationalist religious zealot wants to take our country and all its progress back to the 1800s is that making America great again? Is infighting and inside of all this ignorance violence what godly men in this country do now? I ask you my fellow Americans? When? When is enough, enough? Until next time this is your pal Tuxedo Mask, stay curious, live, laughing for God's sake, love one another the world looks to America to be a shining hope of democracy and there was a time when its citizens didn't take that for granted. Let's be better. Let's do better. Violent protest has no place in a civilized America. Domestic terrorism and non-violent protest are not the same thing. The distinction between non-violent and violent protests primarily hinges on the actions taken by the protesters and the impact those actions have on public safety, property, and the rights of others. Here's how these two categories differ. Non-violent protests. Non-violent protests adhere to principles that emphasize the protection of human dignity, the respect for the rights of others, and the maintenance of public order. 
These protests are characterized by Peaceful assembly, protesters gather without causing harm to others or their property. They aim to express their views and raise awareness without resorting to aggression. Civil disobedience, this involves the deliberate and peaceful violation of laws deemed unjust. Participants willingly accept the legal consequences of their actions. Dialogue and communication, nonviolent protesters often seek to engage in dialogue with authorities and the public to address grievances and find solutions. Symbolic acts, these include sit-ins, marches, and other forms of symbolic resistance that draw attention to issues without causing physical harm. Legal rights, nonviolent protests often take place within the framework of legal rights to free speech and assembly, which are protected under international human rights law. Violent protests. Violent protests cross the line into unacceptable behavior when they involve Physical harm, any act that results in injury or death to individuals, including law enforcement and bystanders. Property damage, destruction or defacement of public or private property, which goes beyond the bounds of lawful protest. Intimidation and threats, actions intended to instill fear or coerce individuals or groups, undermining the principles of free and open debate. Disruption of essential services, blocking emergency services or critical infrastructure in a way that endangers public health and safety. Looting and rioting, unauthorized taking of goods and widespread disorder, which often leads to significant economic damage and loss of trust in social institutions. Domestic terrorism. Domestic terrorism refers to acts of violence that are intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population or to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion, typically within a country's own borders. It can emerge from violent protests when the actions taken are designed to create fear and disrupt societal stability, often targeting civilians or public institutions. The fine line between these categories is often determined by the intent and actions of the individuals involved. Nonviolent protests seek to make a point and influence change peacefully, whereas violent protests and domestic terrorism involve actions that cause harm and violate the rights of others. Authorities and legal systems are tasked with distinguishing between these types of activities and responding appropriately to uphold the rule of law while protecting the right to peaceful protest.